Hi, this is Mark Ogney. I'm the uh, founder of the Account-Based Marketing Consortium and EVP at Demand Metric. I wanted to welcome everybody today and to uh, uh, thank all the people who are going to be presenting today and to set a tone for the consortium and the direction that we've been heading. We'll look at our capabilities framework in just a moment, but what's really important is we've developed just a, a great following of, of people such as yourself, and we're so appreciative of that. Today we've had more than 600 registrants across four continents, and we're just flattered. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, this is really an important topic, and today you're going to be hearing from uh, executives at some of the top platforms from across the world. And uh, something that struck me today is that this is really, you know, representative of such an immense amount of learning on account-based marketing. So these case studies today um, are, are from very large companies. They're from global organizations. We're going to be hearing from uh, EMEA, APAC, and, of course, North America. There's uh, just a tremendous amount, really unparalleled quantity of, of client engagement experience that we're going to be sharing today and uh, really look forward to the presentations. So a quick uh, couple of house cleaning tips here is that um, if you have any questions, we will be conducting an exhaustive Q&A at the end of the presentation today. You'll notice in your interface that there's a Q&A chat section. Click that, enter your questions through the Q&A chat. We're going to be aggregating those, and we'll be addressing all of them, at, as many as we can, at the end of the presentations today. Next, also, prep your Twitter account, because you'll notice that the, the header as well as the footer of each of these slides will have the handles of the people who are presenting. We'd love to see your uh, sharing of the content that's going out today. I think you'll find some really great stuff that's very compelling for you to be sharing as well. And then one last note is uh, Nani Jansen is standing in for Peter Isaacson today. Uh, Peter is out sick, and we're happy to have Nani, Nani on board, and we look forward to hearing her section as well. So moving into the first bit of information here, uh, we conducted research in December that looked at what we call our uh, six capabilities uh, of account-based marketing. This framework uh, is gaining a lot of traction because rather than a, a catchy jingle or a top ten list, this really describes the process that you need to think about as an ABM practitioner. You obviously, you need to select the correct accounts. You have to have insights and account plans and marketing plans. Uh, and the right kind of data around those accounts. You need content that speaks to the objectives of your marketing plan. You need to be able to tune that content to the stage of engagement that that uh, the client organization is at. <clears throat> and then you need to deliver and hopefully develop an experiential relationship with your target audiences across multiple channels and then obviously measure. Now, the key studies we're going to be looking at today are going to be tying back into this capabilities framework. We're going to try to uh, identify the work that each of these uh, people have done on specific elements of the framework and then demonstrate how that helped to affect uh, the outcomes that they presented for their clients. Up first, I'd like to uh, present uh, Robert Slaughter. He's the president of Marcustry, and I'll let you take the handle from here. Go away. Take, the, take it away, Robert. Thank you, Mark. I really do appreciate it. Um, appreciate being invited uh, to, to attend today's uh, webinar. And uh, before we get kicking, I just uh, had my computer crash on me, but we're not going to let that uh, stop the show here, if you will. So um, we're very excited, and we are actually honored to be participating in today's uh, webinar as we feel these practitioner-based uh, webinars offer the best information and the best what we call proven practices. We don't believe there are any best practices out there. So a little bit about Mark's Street real quick before I, I kick it off. And, and Mark, just to let you know, I am running blind here right now. My apologies. So Mark's Street, uh, we are a, a demand generation, a strategic demand generation and ABM, um, a revenue generating firm, if you will. So we work with organizations uh, throughout the uh, the world to look at uh, their uh, their goals and to put frameworks and then campaigns in front of them. What we have seen with account-based marketing is that it is best served right now as a managed service or ABM as a service, if you will, 
Our wheelhouse is what we call uh, classic ABM or uh, uh, bespoke ABM, where we get very detailed and customized with the account itself. We will go deep into um, uh, revenue plans, impact models, uh, going into you know all of the account planning, taking a very deep dive into those accounts, and that works great for up to 15 to 100 accounts. But when we need to scale account-based marketing, uh, that's when we turn to strategic partners like Vendemore and Freya News, who have been doing industrial, industrial, industrial scalable account-based marketing for you know close to, to nine years. Let me see if I can pull up the presentation real quickly, Mark. My apologies. Hey, Robert, I can steer the slides for you, so just let me know when you'd like to change. Yeah, sure. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and go into uh, the actual uh, – yeah, I'm not going to be able to pull this up. My apologies, everyone online. Why don't we go ahead and go into the uh, the case slide, please, Mark? It is. Right there. So the, 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 case, the case that I'll be speaking to today is a uh, very large financial services organization, the second largest uh, stock market on the planet. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to use their name for a variety of di uh, different legal reasons. I think we we all we all can uh, understand that. So what we've tried to do here today is, you know, and, and, and taking a big step back. And my apologies, you know, we see the the big miss right now with account based marketing that there are a lot of people rushing into uh, ABM. A lot of marketing teams are running just fast and furious at ABM. Uh, without thinking about holistically how are these how are they going to handle ABM? So uh, what I mean by that, it's a whole different mindset first and foremost. We look at ABM, they're different metrics. Uh, it's a whole transformational process inside of a marketing organization. That has to be addressed first and foremost. You're looking at accounts, you're not looking at leads anymore. That takes marketing, uh, it, it's hard for a lot of marketing organizations to get their arms around that, if you will. So what we also have done here is looking at, uh, uh, with uh, this particular financial services customer, what we'll be talking about today are the two steps in the process, mostly our insights and the content. That's really where, not to dismiss any of the other steps in the process, but really uh, insights and content is what drove this successful ABM campaign for us. So when working with this uh, organization, the first thing that we noticed, a lot like most of our clients on the enterprise level, they were drowning in two things, data and content. They had more data than they could possibly ever use. They have more, they're drowning in just content, producing more and more content only not to be used. Because once again, they simply did not have any expertise or bandwidth to, to one, take all this data and um, to connect the dots, if you will, to draw insights out of all of this data, to take the data out of silos and use it effectively inside of their ABM campaigns. So talking with the, uh, speaking specifically to Insight, we spent a tremendous time looking at all the data that was already available to us with this particular client. Uh, CRM was really not a factor with this particular client because they are going through a migration to a new one. But what we found was is they had a rock star sales team, a phenomenal rock star sales team. That sales team had a tremendous amount of data and insights about these key counts that they wanted to target. So what did we do? We invited them to coffee to sit down with the marketing team and open up a dialogue and conversation. The marketing team was seen simply as, you know, uh, give us some air cover with this particular client. They weren't seen as real partners in going after these, these accounts. But getting them to, to sit down and getting marketing to understand where sales was coming from, and then to get sales to open up and trust the marketing team that they were going to supply them the proper uh, campaigns and the proper coverage, really got the dialogue moving. And we spent a lot of time interviewing the sales team and drawing out a great amount of data and insights about the, the key accounts that we need to target with this particular campaign. Uh, also, we, of course, built out very sophisticated personas uh, on the account level. 
And something else that really, that, you know, I use it as an example, one of our business ana uh, analysts found in one of the major key accounts, he noticed that 100% of the traffic that was, uh, they were generating from this account was coming from mobile devices. And that's something that this, the, you know, our client would have never been able to action. So we were able to take a hard pivot with this particular account, and this was a major account. We were able to pivot. We were then able to adapt and customize different content and also the delivery method of that content. Once again, that just simply gets back to the fact that these marketing teams are well-intentioned. Uh, but, you know, having someone, uh, and, and you can see from the, the first slides about the Sherpa, someone guiding them through, through this process, making sure that they are being, uh, they're following the correct path, and they're not, you know, they're missing the danger and the risk spots. So that's just a good example of one of the ways that we were able to really kind of pinpoint some insights and deliver that back to this, this, this client um, uh, effectively. Then also getting into, that really helped drive a lot of the, uh, the, the content that we, we delivered as well. So on the, the content piece, excuse me one second. So once again, with the content, they, this organization, a uh, global organization, had more content than they knew what to do with. But what they weren't doing effectively is they weren't uh, personalizing this content. And of course, they weren't then mapping this content against the buyer's journey. So once again, that's where we came, got involved with and really uh, took a deep dive. We interviewed once again. We interviewed the sales team, the marketing team, the product team, and actually did uh, client interviews as well to develop what were uh, pieces of content that resonated well with, uh, with some of these clients. So that allowed us to go back in, and there really wasn't a, a massive amount of content creation that was needed at that point. It was more, like I said, just to uh, uh, personalize the content and to curate the content on their side. So what did all this do? And I'm sorry for the, the abridged uh, uh, presentation here. So what did all this do for the, the, the client? So uh, in this case, we were able to help them reactivate, uh, I believe, 30 of the accounts that they had uh, targeted on the list. And uh, that actually drove a, a massive amount of revenue that they'd be left on the table. This campaign is only, I believe, about maybe 60 days old, so we're still in the midst of this, but the, the results are phenomenal with this right now. But it also allowed them to invest this revenue that they were, they were leaving on the table into uh, an SDR, and that SDR now is helping even convert at a higher rate on these trials. So, um, sorry I flew through that, Mark. <laughs> no, I think we did well. We uh, recovered there. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. We're really happy to have Marcustry on board, and this case study was uh, fantastic. I did see something uh, cruise through from uh, a participant at Cisco, and we're not going to generally run questions uh, in line here, but um, he was asking how long were you running this campaign, but I think you just answered that, so I wanted to confirm uh, you're, this is a six-week multi-touch campaign uh, that you're working with this uh, financial services account. That that okay. is that is hey, correct. Sir. So we they, we yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. We're going to uh, pass the baton here to the CEO of uh, Azalee, uh, Nick Hayes. And uh, Nick, Nick, take it away from here, okay? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, so. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, one of our customers, iAdvise, uh, and, and their path to ABM maturity. As a lead is a, is a ABM software company. We're a pure play software company, and we provide the tools to companies like iAdvise to help them automate and scale their ABM programs. iAdvise is a customer that we met about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and they were doing mainly inbound marketing, uh, mainly producing great content, uh, throwing it out there on the web and, uh, and waiting for people to come in, subscribe to the web forums, and then they would feed that over to the salespeople. And the marketing people were doing pretty good in, 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 in ma making their numbers from an NQL perspective, but the salespeople were, were not that happy with the, with the quality of the leads. So 
Uh, in early 2015, they stepped up to account-based marketing for customer acquisition. They primarily used it to provide air cover to those target accounts that the sales guys weren't able to reach. Um, and so we ran that nurturing program for them for, throughout 2015, and that was successful in helping them win more target accounts. Um, but then late 15, they hired uh, an account-based marketing manager, and I was really happy that because I, we don't see many account-based marketing managers on the client side. Um, and this account-based uh, uh, account -based manager, he decided that account-based marketing was also going to be good for cross-selling to existing customers. Um, and that's the program they put in place early this year, and I'm going to be sharing with you here today. So iVise is a uh, medium-sized software company, very fast growth company. They're growing at about 50% a year right now, uh, 170 people, 40 people in sales, 10 people in marketing, and they have operations in five countries with over 1,000 customers. So as you can guess, this is a fast-growing software company, and they have been historically primarily focused on market share and winning new accounts. And that's how they use account-based marketing in 15. What's new in 2016 for this account is that they started to use account-based marketing for upselling and cross-selling to their existing client base of over 1,000 accounts. And to summarize how they use our systems, one is they put a tag on their website and that enables them to build segments of accounts from their website traffic. And then they send out ads to their target accounts. Uh, and in this case, they used our system to send out ads to help increase cross-selling with existing accounts. And then in parallel, they send buying signals to their sales reps, so each sales rep owns uh, an account and he or she will receive buying signals in real time whenever one of those target accounts shows a buying signal. This helps their salespeople focus on those accounts most likely to buy. So coming down to the ABM capabilities framework, um, on the account selection side, uh, they didn't really need any help from as lead in selecting email lists because they already had a CRM and marketing automation platform in place. And so uh, where we help them uh, increase their engagement on those existing accounts is by placing a tag on their website and on their software login page that enabled them to build a cookie list on all of their target existing accounts. And that in the system happened over about a 30-day period where they were able to build up this new file of accounts on a cookie base. The Azure technology enables customers to be able to identify which company is on their website, place a cookie, and build, build up the database so that they can do account selection and set up rules to send out targeted email messages, sorry, tar targeted ad messages, as well as buying signals. On the, uh, on the, uh, this, on the uh, orchestration side, we helped iAdvise put in place a combination of over 12 different promotions. Uh, they had three cost sell offers. They had a, a social offer, a video offer, and a voice offer. And they identified four key verticals, retail, fashion, retail tech, automobile, and hospitality. And that created a total combination of 12 different types of offers that would go out depending on, on the target account. And so we helped them build this, this program in our system so that the messages would have the maximum amount of impact and the highest level of relevance to each target account. On the delivery side of the capabilities framework, um, our system is hooked up to ad exchanges so that customers like iAdvice can go in there, build up their different uh, lists in, in the DMP that we provide, so they can go out there and build their uh, different target accounts, build scenarios, and send out messages only to those target accounts. And this leads to highly targeted, zero-wasted zero wastage advertising only to those target accounts that have been selected. So this enables them to focus their ad spend on those accounts that count.
the sales guys are not happy uh, because now they're getting buying singles on the accounts that they want to win, on the accounts that they want to expand, and they're able to prioritize their time on those that are showing buying signals, that those that are engaging. Um, and by clicking on their ADM app that we provide with them, with, to each salesperson, they're able to log in and see which pages, which offers are of most interest so they can have a smart and, and timely conversation with, with each of their target accounts. The results, well, I can share these results with you. The, um, the marketing team almost doubled their level of marketing engagement in the form of clicks versus email only. Uh, through these targeted ad campaigns to their existing client base, they were able to double, almost double their, their level of engagement. And the sales guys were able to uh, better use their time and, and focus on those accounts they're most likely to buy. And I just talked to the customer uh, today prior to this call, and uh, they told me they had a, a record first quarter, particularly in the area of account expansion, thanks to their account-based marketing program. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. That was a great case study. Uh, I'd like to pass the baton now to Nani Jansen, in, uh, as mentioned earlier, standing in for Peter Isaacson today. Take it away, Nani. Thanks. Thanks. Excited to be here. And um, I know Peter is always a little bit better at the jokes than I am, but we'll we'll hobble through the best we can anyway. Um, so I want to start just by thinking about um, kind of a refresher on why ABM is so important. I know we've talked a lot about it today, but I, I think it never hurts to kind of review. Um, first, you're really able to focus on the best opportunities. You're selecting accounts that have the best potential. And here you're thinking about um, not volume, but really quality. Second, you're able to, to support the sales reality. You're delivering on their target accounts. You're aligning with the accounts that are most important to them. The third element there is that um, you're able to deliver a more personalized, more customer-centric experience once you're focusing on that, that limited, more narrow set of customers. Um, and then finally, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more um, once we get into the case studies, but you're able to connect your marketing activity to revenue, and that becomes a really um, powerful tool. So how do you get started with ABM? Um, we within the, the ABM consortium obviously are focusing on the, the capabilities framework, which outlines six elements of a successful ABM strategy. But at Demandbase, we, we narrow that down to four key steps. So first, you're aligning your sales and marketing team. You're getting the right players in the room. You're talking about um, the, the same types of things. And jointly, you're going to be able to identify that set of target accounts that you're going to put together. So, so working in tandem to build out the target account list that you want to go after. And then third, kind of obviously, you're going to be developing an ABM marketing plan. So how do you um, build a strategy that sets out tactics that are all seen through that ABM lens of focusing on those target accounts? And then fourth um, is, is really measuring, making sure that with every activity that you're doing, with every tactic that you employ, with every strategy that you build out, that you're able to measure its impact. Um, and again, I'm going to kind of go into a little bit more depth on that, that measurement por portion when we go into the case studies, but be thinking about the types of measurements that you want to take that are relevant for an ABM strategy. And those are the ones that are really going to have the biggest business impact rather than just being campaign metrics. I'm actually going to walk through um, two case studies today uh, that each take a little bit of a different flavor of an ABM strategy. Um, but, but first, I'm going to talk about Invenio. And their main, their primary goal um, or primary motivation was to think about their website as their main source of lead generation. So as many of you know, when, when it's built well, a website can really provide an efficient and reliable source of inbound interest. Um, and so in order to, to kind of set up this, this new strategy of theirs, Invenio first wanted to understand, well, who's coming to their site to begin with, which accounts are visiting, how much of their web traffic is, is junk, um, and how much, how much is, is gold. 
Um, importantly, they also wanted to be able to identify the web traffic before it had announced itself with something like a form fill. So they wanted to know which companies are coming to their site um, without having to rely on just the data that was flowing into their marketing automation system from form. Once they had established that baseline, then they could move on to think about, okay, well, how are we going to attract the right accounts to the site um, and boost the numbers from the accounts that are most likely to buy? And finally, um, really one of the goals they wanted to have was, was around increasing conversions out the back end. So how many of those target accounts can they get to fill out that form um, and, and, and convert into opportunities? So that was the goal. Um, and when we think about the results from this, I want to just take, take a second to talk about this, this upper left metric that we've got here, um, which is lift. And um, when, when we talk about lift, what I mean by that is compared to that baseline that Invenio took where they had seen how many of their target accounts were already on their site, um, how many more after running their campaign were either net new coming to the site, so hadn't been there at all during the, the uh, uh, baseline period, or how many were more engaged, were on the site for longer, were visiting more pages. And if either of those criteria were met, we would consider that company lifted. So they actually ended up having um, really tremendous results when it came to lift, um, a full 65% of their target account list lifted. So they were either completely new to the site, and you can see um, on the bottom right there that 300 of those accounts, more than 300 of the, the accounts were net new to the site, um, but also um, were more engaged, were spending more time on the site, were seeing content that was relevant to them and staying there. So that's where you see kind of that remarkable stat there, about a 900% increase in the page views from those target companies. So really getting them to, to stick, uh, stick around on the site. And then finally, I'd say the, the real um, power in the, the success of this strategy came out in the number of conversions that they were getting all the way into to MQL. So not even just form fills, but into real opportunities that are going to the sales team. They had a 20% a um, 20 of that list actually ended up as an MQL, which is huge. Um, and when we think back to that initial slide that I was talking about with connecting marketing tactics to revenue, that's where you really start to see, okay, we're running campaigns, we're driving um, engagement on the site, but that's all in service to real sales opportunities uh, down the line. And the second case study actually had a slightly different goal. So um, we, we worked with Atmel to figure out how they could drive engagement in specific vertical segments that they wanted to be going after. And the way that they went about doing that um, first was to personalize their homepage, both in the overall messaging, so making sure that when one of those um, verticals came to their site that they were getting a, a message that was relevant to them, but also um, in the content assets that were available. So if, for example, you had someone from the automotive industry coming on, there might be a case study um, very relevant to the automotive industry ready for download. The second um, uh, strategy that they used in order to drive engagement from those vertical segments um, was to, to make sure they were attracting the prospects from those vertical accounts. So what, how could they target um, their advertising specifically to those um, to those verticals and drive them onto the site. And all of that, again, was in service to being able to identify those sales opportunities in real time and be able to deliver to their sales team insight on the accounts that were exhibiting buying signals. So we, again, saw, saw really some compelling results um, from, from Atmel's partnership with us. Um, they saw a, a 53% increase in, in the downloads from those assets, and that's really kind of a testament to the, the relevancy for those particular vertical segments. So rather than seeing a generic case study or a case study that was maybe more appropriate for somebody else, um, those verticals were seeing information that was important for them. They also had um, a 10% increase in the sales accepted opportunities from those accounts. And that's really key because that's starting to build out that marketing and sales alignment that we talked about earlier, where sales is seeing the quality of the leads that are coming in from marketing as being um, 
much better. And that builds a certain level of trust that then lends itself to greater increases and greater follow-up rates from the inquiries that are coming on in from, the, um, from those marketing channels. So that was really great to see. Um, and then if we dig in kind of specifically into those, those verticals that they were targeting, you can see they did target the automotive industry and they had a 156% increase in the opportunities coming from that. Um, and then for their, their consumer electronics um, vertical, they had seen a 54% increase there. So really across the board, once again, they're, they're seeing the results of their marketing efforts play out all the way through the sales funnel. So you'd say, you know, between Invenio and Atmel, they had different goals in mind, but they were both employing a structured and thoughtful account-based marketing strategy in order to reach their goal. And for them, it ended up, for both of them, um, ended up playing out really well. And with that, I think I will pass it back to Mark unless we've got, I think we might have a question or two from the audience. We'll, we'll do the questions as we get to the end, um, and that's a good time for reminder is that uh, on your interface, there's a chat uh, capability that says Q&A. Um, please enter your questions there. We're accumulating them, and we'll have a chat session um, going through these with all of the, the, the different markers here uh, at the end. Um, also, social, if you're not tracking it right now, it's just uh, – I keep getting alarms sent off here like every couple of seconds with another tweet coming through. So there's a really great discussion going on throughout Twitter right now. Uh, if you're not participating, please jump in. And so thank you very much, Nani. I'm going to pass the baton now to Joachim from Freya News. Take it away. Thanks, Mark. Um, just a bit of background about us before we get going. Freya News, we're, we're a full-service account-based marketing agency, so we help companies uh, pretty much all over the world with their ABM programs, either by them outsourcing everything to us or where we're helping them within certain uh, segments. Um, today, I'm going to go through the outlines of um, an ABM project with one of my clients, which is KPMG. Um, I'll be focusing on uh, three steps mainly uh, of this framework for, for the project, which is the insights, uh, content, and distribution or delivery, which, uh, which it is in, in the framework. Um, but before we get get to uh, get started with that, I just want to address a couple of you know important points to to think about when it comes to account based marketing. And you know it's, it's pretty basic things, but it's it's looking back to having you know an ABM ABM plan in place. Um, why it's you know it's needed to create account specific content instead of just reusing or rehashing old content that you might have for your marketing automation programs and um, you know f trying to find out the right technology as well so um, just want to put it into to perspective I like using sports analogies so let's all pretend that we're we're being a coach for a, a sports team in, in the playoffs um, that I guess entails, you know, that every contender is unique. Um, you know, each game is is completely new. There's no room for failure. You know, once uh, once you're out, you're out. So you have to create. Um, you know, all of these games requires a, a new strategy, a new a unique strategy for victory. So, without any any insights or you know, well-prepared research about your opponent or, or the targeted accounts. And, and in this case, you won't know how they're lining up, so to speak. So you, you obviously want to know what kind of challenges they're facing or, or you know, even what kind of potential ends or opportunities that, that you might have. And, you know, if, if you don't do the research behind that or do the ABM plan properly, you won't have really enough information to be able to create a game-winning strategy to, to get that win. Um, and also, a thing that is uh, tends to, to to be forgotten is that um, you know in business as well as in sports, it's it's about teamwork. You know, we we help each other, back each other up, and everyone influences each other. Uh, Obviously, in sports, there's coaches, there's janitorial equipment staff, and obviously the players that all work together. Um, 
And I guess we can take that over to business, you know, where the whole line of business, different, different business units, uh, seniority levels, and, and so on and so forth. But um, what I'm trying to say is, I guess, you know, it, it, it sure helps to understand a little bit about, you know, one's star player or one of the star players or, or the persona. But since everyone is working as a team and communicating with each other, you know, it's, it's a it's it's just not enough to be communicating with one or tar targeting one person. You you really need to to understand the the opponent or, or the targeted account and be able to uh, communicate and engage with all of them on their level of knowledge and in their way. So we always Fred Fred News always starts with creating an ABM plan, so you're able to you know get that in depth knowledge and understanding of. Um, your potential client and, and account. And this is also where we and Marcus Street think in a very similar way in regards to the ABM plan where, you know, where we're already engaging in handling cross-Atlantic cases together. And um, Marcus Street has, has a great in-depth knowledge around how to blend strategic thinking with ABM and the marketing automation systems. Um, but I guess, you know, start, starting, starting off with, with uh, the the outlines of the ABM project with KPMG, uh, it's about supporting large deals. They're uh, targeting one specific organization. It's lengthy sales cycles. Um, unfortunately, I can't <laughs> divulge that much um, about it. But let's just jump straight into the, the insights and the ABM plan. Um, Obviously, they're very, you know, they're a very mature organization when it comes to digital transformation. You know, they they have a good account-based marketing focus. I would say that, you know, they're they're very up to date and a, and an early adopter among their peers, at least when it comes to to account-based marketing. Um, but when it comes to to the account-based marketing plan, there's there's quite a few things to consider and include. So. Normally, we start to look at the target client overview where, you know, you have to dig deep for information to try to, you know, find out what's the, the client's relationship with our client. Um, we're looking into the challenges in the sales process, identifying all the stakeholders to gain an understanding of uh, where our client is in the, the sales process with, uh, with the, this specific account. Um, when it comes to the content part in the ABM plan, we obviously have to look at what are the main topics of uh, the physical discussions. We try to conduct different interviews, um, focus on areas you know, of extra importance where, where we you know, can push them extra much. Um, also go through you know, the distribution models. What, you know, what, what technology are we going to use to be able to reach every stakeholder and all of the informal decision makers within the account and also within the different business units within this account? So you could li literally say it's, you know, companies within the company. Um, our ABM plans are also looking into, you know, they have the light social media ABM plan, so to speak. So, you know, we promote the, the consultants to use the content that we create to um, provide insights to specific persons within a, a targeted account. I guess, you know, that's what people call social selling nowadays. Um, but normally, you know, we have, we have six people working um, in an ABM team from Freya. Um, with KPMG, they have 10 people from their side uh, working on this specific account as well. Um, there's 100% transparency between the teams, which is, you know, amazing, makes, makes life a lot easier. Um, and, you know, the main goal for, for this project is to increase the awareness of uh, KPMG as a global thought leader regarding, you know, the various advisory and, and auditing services uh, they offer, as well as, I guess, the ultimate goal is to, to strengthen the relationship between uh, them and their client to be able to put them in a better position to, to win that account. Um, and we do, we, we do that by supporting them with creating uh, content, right? So... The content that we create addresses specific concerns and, you know, educates on issues that promotes a, a common ground between the companies. Uh, it's, the content is, you know, it's engaging and beneficial, but it's also sending a strong message and supporting their sales efforts, you know, which their physical sales team or consultants have. Um, 
in the beginning when we started this, this we're still doing this. It's long sales cycles. It's nothing uh, we do, but it's it's um, trying to lift up a couple of main points to gain more exposure and visibility um, to you know gain trust from this specific account. Um, also, one thing to remember is that the content that is created has to be relevant to a lot of different people. Uh, normally, we see that uh, there's quite a bit, you know, quite quite a lot of different stakeholders that do get involved with um, people from the C-suite, finance functions, shared services, IT, uh, from all the different business units within the company as well, and. Um, what we're trying to do is, I guess, you know, the, rela the relationships are more important than ever. So we need to meet their demand for relevant knowledge in an accessible way. And it's, you know, very important to build a digital relationship while the physical engagement is, is active uh, as well. So we collect all the... Uh, the content that we do, which is more about, you know, creating engaging and interesting pieces of, of content to captivate them in, in, instead of board them out and target that towards, you know, desired groups of stakeholders or, or certain business units within this account. Um, we collate all, all the content on a specific landing page or, you know, I, I like to call it a knowledge hub, which is purpose built and designed with the uh, targeted accounts or, or account in mind um, where, you know, the content is specifically made to mirror and support the, the, the specific sales process. And this is something that we create uh, in-house in, in our own systems. So. You know, it, it's the people. People are involved in the decision-making process. Uh, when it comes to big deals like this, you know, the final decision will always be based on what's best for the company, not what you know one specific person believes or thinks. So, essentially, what we're doing is is we're moving more people faster to take part of, you know, engaging uh, content, trying to involve everyone in in, in the, these large uh, decision-making groups. Um, and how you know how we distribute it is working together with uh, Vendemore, since uh, obviously we have a quite a close relationship with them. They're very experienced within the account-based marketing space. Uh, I think they have a bit more, what nine years experience in that. Work with several Fortune 2000 companies, um, but one of the main benefits with this is that we're able to blend uh, different types of content uh, ads to, to, you know, to meet all types of decision makers and create individual buying journeys depending on which article um, you, an, you interact with. So, and also being able to deliver it globally because this is not just, you know, this, this account does not just exist in one country. It's, it's a, huge network, so to speak. Um, and that's something we do for all our clients. You know, we, we try to mix content on the account level. And I guess, you know, what, what they think of, of this is, um, you know, they're able to strengthen their business relationship by having a constant digital presence with their uh, largest clients, um, you know, becoming more relevant in the market space by continuously delivering high-quality customer-specific uh, uh, content, um, which, which is great. And currently, you know, it's, uh, as I said earlier, you know, this process is still ongoing. So right now we're measuring everything. We have an extremely high engagement level from the targeted account. Um, where we're seeing, you know, what they're engaging in, where they're in their buying journey. Um, we're also able to keep track of um, how many visitors from this specific account that return to take part of further engaging content. So that's also one of our main goals for, for Freya News is to always have somewhere between 20 to 40 percent um, return visitors from, from each targeted account every month. And I guess, you know, right, right now we're in the middle of the, the playoff game. Um, I would say that they have the upper hand, but, you know, to, to be a winner, you really need to, to have, uh, you know, the right strategy in place. You need to have a good message, um, obviously the right team, and, and also to have the, the, the proper distribution model and technology um, to win. 
So, in essence, you know, uh, if anyone has any other questions after this, you're more than welcome to send me an email or, or, or our CEO, Joan, uh, if you have any thoughts or questions as well, even after the q and I'll um, even be able to, I think, offer a 10% discount if, if you guys mark the <laughs> Uh, the email with the ABM webinar after today. But I'm uh, handing it back to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Hey, and we're going to pass the baton now to Christopher Engman at Dundemore. So take it away, Christopher. Great, Mark. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, Joachim. And to give, give a compliment back, uh, there is uh, – I think there's only uh, one agency that's been doing ABM, very focused, coming from the content marketing side, and, and that is uh, Freya. And I think in joint forces with Mark History, I think they're a good coalition. So, and also Mark and the guys at Demand Metric, really impressive, 600 people registered. That's, that's really, really cool. So uh, I'm going to talk about a, a business case with a company called Biznode. And uh, I'm going to talk about... Uh, four of the six capabilities, which is uh, insights, orchestration, targeted delivery, and measurement. Uh, so, but to give you a bit of a background on, on the business case, uh, it's an organization that uh, has a very product-oriented sales force, and they are targeting, in this case, only existing customers, so very much like uh, uh, the guys at Athlete told us about. They're targeting existing customers, and their main goal is cross-selling. They have made a lot of acquisitions over the last 20 years, so and has, has been historically pretty unsuccessful in driving cross-selling. I think this is a common pain for a lot of big, medium-sized and big organizations. And they have focused primarily on five industry verticals. Uh, their main challenges are very few contacts per account. So many salespeople are quite often really focused on talking to the same people about the same old stories. And this is where marketing can make a difference. And also their, their sales force is very product oriented and not so solution selling oriented. Uh, and this is something we see also in a lot of organizations. And uh, also the, the customers are, are not knowing so much about the complete offering that business is having. So, they don't know that they can buy more, more things. And even worse, and this is not very spe specific for business. I think I see this with, so we work with uh, over 300 Fortune 2000 companies. And with most of them, they struggle with cross-selling because salespeople are talking to a few people and they don't know how to sell the bigger offering. Uh, I think you, everyone on the call can probably agree on that. Business is also in a situation where there's fierce competition. There are quite a lot of contenders around the same deals. So they have to find a way of communicating value. So the expected effects that they saw entering this program was, first of all, increase the number of deals and increase the order values. Uh, also to get higher awareness among the, the customers and in the end increase the cross-sell. So we'll later come back to the results. Uh, and I'll share with you a common observation that we've seen. In most organizations, we're looking at the customer base. You typically have pretty high concentration of revenue around a few accounts. So typically 5, 10, 20% of the customer base represents 80, 90, 95% of the revenue. And even some of the biggest companies in the world have this kind of concentration. And looking at how sales money is distributed, we have clients where you have 12, 12 sales reps per target account on the left-hand side in this picture, uh, whereas they have one salesperson per 1,000 customer in the SMB segment, uh, which is, in effect, 12,000 times more sales money per account over here on the left-hand side compared to on the right-hand side. The, the paradox, though, is that We've been spending my marketing money like this. So marketing money has been distributed. Even though we have said we've used targeted methods, it's been distributed widely across the customer base with more or less similar methods, meaning that we have underinvested heavily in the biggest accounts and too much in the small accounts. And since we're spending 12,000 times more money 
on the sales side than we the, or on the left hand side than we do on the right hand side. Marketing should probably be spread out in the same way. So what account based marketing is a lot about and what we try to do in all our cases is one, to grow the existing customers through cross selling initiatives and secondly to win big bids to enter new top top accounts. Account based marketing, in my view and in our experience, does not fit the the long tail. In the long tail, use telemarketing, use events, use uh, cold calling, use um, yeah, fairs, uh, inbound marketing, etc. Um, so one thing that we have seen working really well, uh, so in the business case, they have 40 content pieces. And since you don't want to show every content piece to every account, you have to do much like like both uh, Joachim and and Robert touched upon, you have to look at, okay, what's the account plan per account and what kind of content do you want to play per account? We more and more use an analogy with poker cards. So let's assume uh, the content pieces are seen as poker cards and the customer base can look like this. So customer one is using solution A and solution, solution D. Solution C doesn't fit. Solution B does fit. And, and you probably understand this matrix. What we want to do in this scenario is to be able to blend the poker cards uniquely per account. And first, based on research and assumptions, but then you want to change it over time. So what we try to do with the customers is that we sit down with them on a regular basis and actually change tactics on an ongoing basis. And this is really fun. I love those meetings. Uh, so and in this case, when we focus on, on the customer number three here, we want to show maybe something else. So in the business case, they have 40 different pieces of content. I'll show you some of those examples. Uh, but before going into that, we can look at another perspective of illustrating the customer base. So in our, in our experience, at the top of the period on your best accounts, you should be using account-based marketing on a nonstop basis. You should change stories. You should change tactics uh, on a constant basis, but you should be kind of always on. Whereas on your second tier, I mean, the top of the pyramid can be 10, 50, a max 100 accounts on a global basis, whereas the, the second tier can be several hundred accounts up to several thousand accounts. And here, here we recommend something we call trolling, so account-based trolling. So what you want to do, uh, going back to this one, this picture, you want to you take your target accounts, oops, sorry, you want to show uh, a lot of content to a much, much, much longer list of accounts. But then based on how they react, you want to narrow down the number of accounts. So the accounts that are not showing a great interest, you want to shut them down. And the accounts that are showing great interest, you want to continue. But as an example, if uh, customer 89 here, out of the two areas we're promoting to them, they're just showing an interest in area A, we can shut down area B. And uh, in an instant. And that is, that is very successful. And we call it trolling. That, that way you can actually, with a, a, a moderate budget, you can target a big group of companies, but you then filter down the number of accounts and the stories per account by actually looking at the statistics. On the, the low priority part, don't use ABM at all. So looking at some examples from, from BizNode, uh, they are using a mix of more very generic content. They're blending it with vertical, vertically specific content. And as Joachim and, and Robert talked about, in some cases, in the most important accounts, like for KPMG is a good example, they use account-specific content. But they are blending this. So in this case, these are some examples. It's our experience is that content-heavy ads are working the best. So. If you can promote your various pieces of content through ad space, targeting only your most important accounts, that is really successful. Uh, and uh, there's so, and obviously every ad then leads to a landing page. And in this case, it's a mix of an article and a video. In this case, an article, etc. Uh, so. Yeah, so they, this in this case is mixing content per account based on tactical situation. Where are they in the sales process? Like some other guys mentioned. 
which crossing is initiative are we driving? And if it's a, sometimes we see this more and more. I think it comes with majority, uh, maturity. More and more companies are becoming mature in their ABM programs. And we see more and more money moving into even defense. Oh, these are my top five accounts. I don't want to lose them. Whatever happens, I don't want to lose them. So that's something we see more and more. So in the business example, this is how they blend uh, content and ads per account. And then uh, the actual reporting, and I, I skipped the marketing reporting because it's very, very detailed. But what we show to sales is that, we, let's say I'm the account manager for, for these three retail accounts, we can see exactly what content piece is resonating in the ad, so we, which, where we had click, click through in, in, the, in the ad solution so per account. So this is actually telling sales which area is interesting for, for which accounts. Um, because what you want to do, and we've seen, I, I think I mentioned in the beginning, 50% of the value of account-based marketing is actually prioritizing salespeople's time. So in this case, we want to select which accounts should we spend most time with, uh, which solution should we drive per account. And in this case, we're not doing this with this business yet, but with many other clients which persona type is showing the most interest per account. Um, I want to share with you the, the, the financial part of it. Uh, so what we, what we measure over time are four things. The first and immediate thing you see is a traffic increase, like some of the other guys were mentioning. But some things that I didn't hear so much about was what would you see in number of contacts increasing, number of opportunities increasing, and ultimately revenue. And the best way of measuring this, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot this. So and what's, what's important to remember, co compared to some more, some more tactics that are very, very focused on a fast conversion, account-based marketing is a, is, a, is a marathon. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So what's important to remember is that we're building awareness, confidence, and trust within these target accounts, and that is growing over time. And that's something we can harvest long term. I'll show you the financial case around this. Now. And despite them having a, a quite weak solution selling sales force uh, and, and very product centric, et cetera, and actually pretty, pretty low order values compared to most of our clients, this is the kind of development you want to see when you, when you compare A accounts that we are targeting with B accounts that we're not targeting. And A accounts, in this case, to make it credible, has to be equally important as the B accounts. And we measure it over three time periods, before, during, but short term, and during, but long term. Uh, and, and again, awareness, confidence, and trust is growing over time. And what we measure is deals per account, deal velocity, so how fast is the sales closing, and then ultimately how big deals are we making. Uh, and the really cool, cool thing in this, in this scenario is that uh, we've been measuring this over, over 18 months, uh, and we saw in the beginning, between the A group and the B group, there, there was a, uh, a gap of 20,000, so per, per, per account per month. But then after, the, well, now actually, the gap is 50,000 per month per account in difference. So, we see a, a 150% higher revenue increase per account compared to the accounts we're not targeting. And they are equally important to get equal sales attention, et cetera. Uh, I think this is pretty cool. We, we have some other cases where one of our best clients, he got promoted from sales and marketing director into CEO because they were doubling their profit and start to grow the, the, twice as fast as they did before. Uh, uh, we're actually going to skip this one. Uh, so the organizational learnings I can, I can share with you later on. Everyone that's contacted me, I gladly share them, uh, and they're quite interesting. But let's go into uh, what's going on. Let me just wrap up with, with our key learnings.
maybe you guys see interested in me. Uh, so we think it's important to work with account-based marketing and not list-based marketing. Uh, there are quite a few companies that say they do account-based marketing, but it's basically a long list of companies and you show the same thing to all. Uh, we've seen that not working so well. He used the poker card analogy when it comes to content. So play poker cards uniquely per account. And then if you have a longer list of accounts, use the trolling approach where you actually, based on the response, you filter the list down to make it more and more narrow. And 50% of the value is coming from prioritizing salespeople's time. Which accounts, which theme, and which persona should I be focusing on? And last but not least, so these are the financial results from the business case. Uh, a few words about us. We, we work uh, with uh, over 300 Fortune 2000 companies uh, in nine, uh, we've done it for nine years and we, we do work globally. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you, awesome. Christopher, thank you very much. Hey, I'm gonna pass the baton now to Kevin Cunningham at MRP. Take it away, Kevin. Hey, everyone. Um, th thanks, Mark. And I'll try to keep this brief. I know I'm the last one up uh, for this webinar, so um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to not, not take up too much time. Um, just a little background on MRP. We're a global end-to-end -end, uh, account-based marketing platform. Uh, we were founded in 2002 as a, as a marketing services agency, you know, really focused on you know, account-led uh, marketing, you know, you know, getting to um, you know, understanding our, our client's target market, um, you know, selecting the accounts and prioritizing and segmenting accounts uh, within that target market has been embedded in everything we've done since since day one. Um, you know, really working with them to understand their their firmographics, uh, what their named accounts are, you know, clients they're looking to grow, and then from all that, you know, understand their white space. And you know, we would use a combination of our clients' internal data as well as you know MRP uh, you know sourced information as well. And it's always been important for us to do this because everything we do with our clients is measured on pipeline and revenue. So, you know, if, if we don't deliver uh, the right metrics in those two core areas, you know, obviously we're, we're not going to be renewed or we're not going to have clients uh, very long. And, and, and many of our clients have been with us for, for over 10 years. Um, you know, from there, we were acquired in 2008 by a European big data um, software and consulting firm. That really allowed us to grow globally and, and build out the platform um, that we have today, which is called Delta. Um, you know, now with, with offices around the world, we have uh, hundreds, if not thousands of, of customers uh, leveraging that platform. And then finally, before I jump into the slides, we in early 2000, 2015, we acquired an organization called Prelytics, which is a predictive analytics firm based on, uh, focused on buying intent uh, from the BDB web. And you know, Prelytics was such a natural fit for us because as we were looking to you know, further prioritize and segment you know, our clients' target market and accounts, it was a no-brainer to, to apply um, intent data to, to do that and then leverage that intent data not only to prioritize but to drive the content um, specific to that client's uh, buyer journey and and, and what they're in market to buy. So, you know, with this case that I have here today, this is, you know, a, a healthcare uh, technology company who was really looking, you know, to, to leverage account-based marketing to drive uh, better results, you know, looking to, you know, the, you know, looking at the current models they have and really looking to, you know, outperform what they've done in previous, previous quarters. So we work with them up front to understand, okay, what does that target market need to look like? And, you know, they really wanted to focus on hospitals in the U.S. in this case. Um, you know, we went through all the firmographics with them, um, uncovered their named accounts, uh, and then married that with, with some white space uh, that we're, we were able to uncover um, on their behalf. You know, from there, once we've selected the accounts and, you know, prioritized those, we, we, we plug those into our prelytics process. Um, from there, we were to take, take those 5,000 accounts, narrow it down to the 1,500 where we saw some buying signals um, in the market and then, you know, map those into the buyer journey of, you know, early, mid, and late. And then from there, once we have, um, once we have that buyer journey mapped out, um, you know, plug that into the rest of our platform where we're able to uncover some other key information. So again, you know, looking 
seeing is the keywords and topic activity that we're seeing against each account. You know, what are they in market to buy? Um, who are the decision makers, you know, at these organizations that are going to be relevant for us to target? That's obviously a, is a critical thing. Um, what's the current infrastructure? Do we know something about, you know, the solutions they have in place today that, that maybe are outdated and, and we're looking to replace? And, you know, from all of that, you know, provide a score and, and be able to you know, leverage this in our execution engine um, downstream. Now, some cli clients can take this prolytics information and put it you know, directly into the engine they already have. For this particular client, they leveraged um, MRP to do the execution. So from, you know, from an execution standpoint, we took you know, our client's existing content and we customized it for, for this particular program that we were looking to, uh, to do. And, and from there, plugged that into Delta Interactive. Um, there, that content was mapped uh, uh, like I mentioned, to buyer journey and purchase intent, and was was funneled through a multi-touch um, integrated, you know, tactical approach. So in terms of some of the ROI on the program, you know, so with, with all our programs, you know, the measurement of the success that we do is, is a key component. And we do that not only, you know, at the account level, but obviously down to the lead level as well. So we look at a, at a hybrid approach here. And, you know, pipeline, again, is going to be a big, a big measure. In this case, it was about a $3.8 million um, increase in pipeline. Um, you know, interestingly, from an email perspective, a little bit of, you know, a softer metric, but it was interesting to see that the content Content that we were leveraging because it was more specific to their buying need and where they were in the buyer journey um, increased you know, responsiveness up to you know, up to 20 percent, which was great. But ultimately, the, the real measures for us are down to SQL and, and really you know converting you know the, the AQLs and MQLs into sales ready opportunities and and you know the, the metrics we have there are significantly better than uh, than industry standards. So uh, saw a lot of great lift there. And then the, finally, for a brand perspective, perspective, you know, this is a little bit, again, of a softer measure, uh, but looking at, you know, just overall, you know, the, the efforts and the tactics that we're, that we're leveraging, because they're more specific, you know, are we having an effect on the brands? And from what we saw from our clients' internal, you know, brand surveys, there was a 10% lift, you know, from the efforts that we employed. So not only hard metrics around, you know, SQL conversion, but also, you know, you know getting more and better brand awareness overall for our clients. And with that, I'll pass it back to, to Mark for questions. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. You know, great case studies from everybody today. I'd like to thank all the presenters and the time that they put into uh, the presentation and uh, invite the audience now to continue inputting questions into the Q&A chat box. I'm, I'm going to start with a couple of them right now, but uh, I'm running live on this, so we can uh, answer those questions in real time as we put them up there. So uh, Rose from Bright Cove submitted a question. Um, we're implementing our ABM strategy currently, creating two funnels, one for uh, current customers for expansion and one for prospects by vertical. Um, that's, oh, okay. Um, oh, she's, I, it continues on to another section. Uh, but for advertising with banners, uh, would you personalize each banner for industry with uh, relatable images or would the advertising come from uh, dynamic content? So I think she's looking for what dimension, giving those two different, um, you know, cross sell upsell on one side and prospecting on the other, how should she think about uh, content and, and segmenting those? I'm going to open the floor up to any of the speakers today. Um, uh, first to chime in gets the first to answer. Um, yeah, uh, Joe, I came here from, from Freya News. Um, I think that, you you know, you should – try to customize it as much as possible to, you know, the better, the more relevant you can be, the better traction um, you'll have from, from, you know, both prospects and uh, current, client, uh, current clients. Now, Christopher, I'm going to direct to you on this, uh, knowing how much work you do with the cross-sell and upsell and, and how much you speak about that. So, for that area of her target list where she's trying to expand, how should she think about content for them? Well, I think, I think actually re, the, a blend of reusing content that you already have, but uh, put it up on the table and then create ads leading to that content and then 
complemented for the most important clients, like uh, Joachim mentioned, with customer-specific content, and then use the poker card method. Like, which card? So let's say this is JP Morgan. I am IBM. I want to grow this big opportunity within JP Morgan. I need to influence a lot of people. And to support that initiative, these are the seven ads I'm using. Whereas when we target uh, Bank of America, uh, we run a completely different initiative. Then we're using another blend of the poker cards. I think that scales the best. That, that's the that's the industrial way of doing it. But you can, of course, which we, we do in cases as well, you can uh, generate uh, unique ads just by the dynamic text. Uh, but we, we've seen a, a bad usage of that. When you start to use, for example, the customer's name in the ad, that's driving a lot of higher click-through, but it has a very high negative tone to it. Uh, and this is regional specific. We've seen less of a reluctance to this in the U.S. compared to what we see in, in Europe. In Europe, people are very sensitive to feeling monitored. Uh, so we, I mean, we do use it in cases, but the, the, the majority of the cases we run is the, is the poker card analogy. We play like in the business case, four business case, forty pieces of content. We blend them uniquely per account. So one account might see three pieces, another account is seeing one of the previous one, but five others, etc. I'll pass it to Nani uh, from a budget perspective. Do you have a point of view as to how you would? Uh... Uh, have to direct people to start on a prospecting versus cross sell uh, initiative. Yeah, um, and and we actually get this question all the time with um, companies that are exploring the use of account based marketing and how they structure their budget and their organization in such a way that they can um, really set up uh, for a strong strategy. And I'd say the thing to think about with budget is is it's less about finding a net new line item for ABM. You're unlikely to say, okay, I'm going to spend X, Y, or Z on ABM. Um, but think more about where you want to direct your resources so that you're maximizing um, the number of target accounts that you're going to be able to hit. And, and so spending your time and your effort um, and your, your budget on those accounts that are likely to convert. Um, so that's kind of the general advice I would give there, and, and that remains true for for however you want to um, target, so whether that's at prospects or a cross sell up upsell campaign. Thank you. And there's a question directed to Kevin. Uh, open this up here to others, though, after his response about a single defining uh, foundation or principle uh, regarding ABM. Do you, do you have maybe this is like the one word of advice uh, scenario? Can you offer a perspective on that, Kevin? I mean, I think the biggest thing there is is really just, you know, again, our, our core principle is, is focusing on, you know, pipeline and revenue conversion, as I'm sure everybody's is, but, you know, just making sure that whatever is done from an ABA perspective is really done towards, you know, driving that key, that key metric. Hello? Hello? Oh, gosh, I've been talking here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I say the best thing is when I'm on mute. <laughs> <That was> anyway. <laughs> so um, I wanted to open that up to anybody else, kind of the uh, the word of advice uh, regarding ABM. Uh, anybody else have a perspective they'd like to share? Okay. There was a, a question, um, and I know, Kevin, you'd raised your hand on this, what about white space? Uh, your definition of white space. Could you put it in context of ABM and uh, uh, offer a perspective there? Sure. So I think, you know, when we work with clients, I mean, commonly they have, you know, again, the, you know, the key, you know, the, the tier one, tier two accounts that they're focusing on from a marketing perspective and maybe, you know, within those, you know, the customers that they're looking to grow. Um, when we take a step back and we do some of our upfront planning and analysis, it's really just looking at, okay, what's the sweet spot for, for them from a firmographic perspective, you know, from a ge geographical perspective, where do they have sales coverage? You know, are they nationwide? Are they only specific regions? Uh, from a vertical perspective, you know, is it a vertical-based solution? And we really need to, you know, 
hone in on specific healthcare companies, like in the example I gave in my case study, or is it more, you know, industry agnostic? And then from a size perspective, it's always a big thing. Like everybody wants to sell the Fortune 2000, and not everybody really has, you know, the capabilities or or team to really do that. And maybe you're focused more on mid market or SMB. So just trying to nail what that sweet spot is from a graphically, map that to you know what they have for for current accounts, and then you know pop out a white space, you know, uh, universe that they're not currently focusing on. Now, obviously, that white space can be very large. So again, we're going to need to, need to you, know, you know, take the, the highest priorities and map that into the, you know, the marketing efforts that we're doing from an, from an ABM perspective. Would anybody else like to share a perspective there? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm just here. Water with Marketry. If I could, oh, go. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So uh, when it comes to I think there are two. I think there are two uh, terms that are good to separate. So, uh, I think uh, what's most commonly used as white space, white space is uh, new clients, whereas uh, green space is uh, the reward for the the openings in existing clients. So, when you want to do cross selling, another way of saying it's well, green space. Green space can also be how can you grow an, an account from one country into seventy countries. That's another kind of green space. So, so uh, white space, in my view, is new clients. Green space is existing clients where there's a growth potential. Um, yeah, that's my five cents on white space. Okay. Hey, and Rob, did I hear you? Yeah, I did. And uh, Rob Slaughter from Marketry, everyone. And, and what I'd like to add is that, you know, I think it, it, it really boils down to, you know, we all want to drive revenue. For our, for our clients and our customers, but setting the right expectations up front is paramount with these folks. You know, we, we talk about, and, and getting back to the analogy that I tried to paint there in my presentation, you know, uh, a lot of our clients are looking for trusted advisors to guide them along this ABM journey. They need them because it's a different type of activity. It's a different type of marketing. They don't, they, they want to make sure that someone that's uh, done this before can help hold their hand. They have a lot of questions. They really do. I'm not saying that we're all the smartest people in the room, but, you know, I, I tell my customers all the time, you can go buy all the Gartner top right technology that you can buy, but that doesn't mean you're ever going to see ROI from an ABM campaign. You have to have the right people, processes, and technology. It's got to be a three-legged table. Once you get all three legs properly positioned, once you get all this up and running inside your organization, then the ROI will most definitely come from ABM campaigns. It's proven. We can demonstrate it over and over again with uh, what we call ABM, spoke ABM practices. There is RB, R, R, ROI at the end of this journey. You just need to be prepared. You need to have your gear. You need to have your guide. You'll get to the summit if you put all it together properly. I can second Christopher Engman here. I can second Robert on that. I think what we've learned over the nine years we've been doing ABM is that uh, a managed service approach is what you want to do. And I, th I think uh, guys like Freya and Mark History are well geared to that. You, you need the product management, you need the content, you need the strategy, and you need the technology. Uh, there, there's uh, this. This is something I, I see in many markets. There is a, a constant lack of talent. So. Uh, the issue with most organizations is that they don't have enough people to pull in to run a big change program. So what, what we've seen successful is to actually uh, run it for the clients as a managed service. For the super mature clients, they can get access to the tools, but it's uh, it's it's the way down the line. Uh, you find It's more like in the SME market, you find people with more time than money. Uh, they rather use the tools directly. When people with more money than time, they rather buy a managed service approach. This is a very, very personal observation. Doesn't necessarily go for the whole market. And one more thing, Thank you. Rob Slar with Market Street, just to kind of uh, tail off of uh, Christopher there. Uh, this managed service approach, I mean, once again, uh, no one likes to stick their neck out all the time. So this also decreases the risk in a lot of organizations where a managed pilot can come in, where we can bring the technology, uh, we can bring the tools, the expertise, and the people. That not only gets the pilot up and running, we can start collecting uh, some data to report back up to the C-suite. It also can produce some quick wins, get more people uh, internally excited 
about ABM and, and, and point them in the right direction. Fantastic. I, I'm going to, I think, oh, go ahead. Did I hear Nick? Sorry about that. Um, moving to another question now. So um, I think this one is with regard to remarketing. Um, so when using IP-based company identification tools, what lag time would you suggest before reaching out to the prospect? A couple hours, a day, two days? Uh, how soon is too soon? Anybody want to uh, say I could that? Chris, Chris, I could that one? Christopher, and then I, I think I heard Rob. Well, Nick, you, Nick, you can go ahead. I, I, I've spoken enough Nick. already. Hi. <laughs> Hi, this is Nick Hayes. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Um, how soon is, is too soon? Uh, I don't think there is a too soon. Uh, I think uh, as soon as your target account has been on your website, uh, you, should, uh, you should be looking to engage with him immediately. Um, so I would, uh, I would set the program uh, to, to send a, a retargeting ad to your target account um, as soon as he's been on your website um, and send a series of sequence messages to vary the uh, – the content and the offers that you're sending to him throughout the whole sales cycle. Yeah, this is Nani Jansen at Demandbase just chiming in on that as well. I, I totally agree that I think there there is no too soon, um, even, even within seconds afterwards um, can be really powerful. That being said, I think the other important element there is to make sure that you're getting that insight to your sales team. And so if you've got a company on your site that they care about, um, engaging the sales team and letting them know about that information can be really powerful because they know more about what's happening specifically at that account um, and can kind of gauge whether they want to reach out personally beyond right. just the marketing, Great, here. Um, you know, retargeting. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think question. probably behind – yeah, thank you. Probably behind the question, there are two aspects. Probably one is how soon can I call them, like in a proactive context. And I think that has to have, probably you guys agree, I think that has to have a delay. You don't send an email like five minutes after being on your site. It's a bit stalky. Whereas uh, when it comes to the, the account based advertising, that's something you can start You can start with straight away. Uh, that, that, because that's not, it's more subtle. It's not as aggressive as an email or a phone call. Fantastic. Hey, there's a really interesting question here from uh, Mike at uh, the Clarlin Group. Prior to engaging in vendor discussions, what should marketing orgs prepare in terms of internal discovery? Anybody want to read something here? on that one? Okay. Yeah, so no, I think uh, what, one mistake that we see lots of companies are doing, they want to test out account based marketing somewhere in the corner where it's not matter, where it doesn't matter so much. I think that's a huge, huge mistake. So, what we see as the most successful path is to start at the very top of the pyramid, your top, top, top accounts. That's where you should start. And even though you might struggle to find the right content, just by being seen more with some relevant messaging to start with, to your top accounts, that does pay off. That, that's what we did with the B2Ks in the first year when they had a, almost a doubling, double uh, profit. They used very simple messaging, and then they in, introduced more and more very smart content, thanks to Freya. Uh, uh, so I think uh, start at the top of the pyramid, and what the team has to do is to figure out, so what are our top 10, top 20 accounts, basically? And, and uh, that's actually not so tricky. Uh, the rest is something we vendors help out with. So which content you should be looking at and how you blend it. And, you know, we've done a few thousand ABM campaigns, for example, and most of the guys here are pretty experienced. I think something implied with your point there, and maybe somebody else can take it from here, is um, discussions not just within the marketing org, but also amongst you know, sales and you know, maybe even finance and other people. Does somebody want to pick that ball up and run with it? Yeah, yeah I think I ultimately. You know, oh, sorry. Is sorry. That Kevin, yeah. is that Kevin? 
Yeah, that, 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 this is Kevin. Um, yeah, one of the things, things I was going to say is it's really, really having a you know a clear plan on what they're going to do with the output from an ABM program. You know, so there's you know, there's a lot of great um, intelligence and opportunities that can come from these, these these programs. But you know, do you have the right resources in place or the right you know downstream execution engine to take whatever comes out of it and and move that along, move that prospect along in the buyer journey, whether it's more targeted content, whether it's you know email retargeting or whatever else, to, down to it you know to an inside sales or more senior account executive um, taking the opportunity. I think that's where we see a lot of the you know where a lot of things fall down is not having that cohesive strategy uh, between marketing and sales handoff. Excellent. And, and did I hear Rob? Uh, I might have mis mistaken that. No, it was I'd me, Joe Kim from from Brandon. I'm sorry. Somebody raised their hand. Joe Kim from hey, Fran. I'm gonna. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Rob. Joe Kim, said, go ahead. Yeah, just like add my two cents on this. Uh, I absolutely agree with all the sentiment around, uh, you know, marketing sales alignment. You know, our our clients and we we proved it. The the sales team is just uh, phenom it has phenomenal depth inside these accounts. I mean, they. They have not only the, the data, but they also have the, uh, the personalized relationships inside these accounts that can really be leveraged by marketing, and they want to be involved. Uh, I think that, you know, and not everybody may agree with me on this, but the last go-around being sold, the, the dream of marketing automation, a lot of sales teams have been off put by that. That dream was not realized. Marketing promised a lot, and it, it just it didn't produce the results sales was expecting. Now, to get them down to sit down to the table and talking about a new strategy, a new ABM strategy, um, a couple things are going to happen. One, you're going to get their buy-in. You need to get their buy-in to get this data. But also, two, it's talking to them through this and getting them to understand this is good old-fashioned key account selling, folks. They're going to understand that. They are going to get on board with that if you're going to help them convert more accounts, if you're going to speed up the sales cycle, if you're going to increase their deal size, you're going to get their attention. So this is also a phenomenal way for sales and marketing to get back together after what could have been maybe a, a, a separation, if you will. Uh, Christopher here. One thing that we see when we run workshops with clients preparing for an ABM program is that, first of all, we, we demand that they bring in their key salespeople into the same room. And a comment that quite, that quite often pops up at the end of the workshop is that people from marketing say, wow, I've never seen sales this engaged. They quite often, quite often look at their iPhone, flipping pages, looking at something else when we run our workshops, but now they're super engaged. I think it's obvious we're targeting the most important accounts. Obviously, sales are getting engaged. So uh, quite often, uh, marketing is spending all of the time on, on accounts that are not in focus by the sales team versus actually spending the time on the accounts where sales are also spending their time. Then you get them engaged. It's not, as co it's not more complicated than that. And another tip, to start a program with bringing in the top two, three salespeople because they will be uh, pioneers internally. They are already seen as idols, icons internally, and if they are engaged in the program, everyone else want to join. That's one learning we've made. I heard Joachim, and, and maybe Kevin wanted to chime in. Joachim, could you uh, offer perspective? Yeah, yeah. No, I just want to uh, pretty much, um, I think Rob and uh, and Christopher made the point I wanted to say as well. It's, um, um, you know, it's the perfect opportunity to uh, to involve sales and, and pretty much make them almost lead lead the project because in the end, that's it's sales that we're, we're supporting here. Uh, I think they, both of them, said what I what I wanted to say as well so and Kevin did did I uh, read properly did you have a point of view um, I think I, I think I addressed it um, earlier, but just in terms of you know going on to where this where this heads. I mean, I think you know we spend a lot of time focusing on ABM for the for the top tier targets for our accounts, and I think as ABM evolves and becomes more mature, it'll allow us to do uh, you know the same level of efforts to our to our entire target market. Excellent. 
You know, I'm going to echo the uh, research that we conducted in December is completely validating to all the discussion that we've been having. Here. If you look at the strata of low, medium, and high performing across the capabilities framework, um, you know, account selection and insights about the account are really the key areas, the starting point of that integration of the sales and marketing conversation. And categorically, lower performing programs miss that. They, they literally are guessing at accounts and they're doing it in the vacuum from sales. And uh, so the research completely backs up uh, this point of view, and I think that it tends to be kind of a garbage in, garbage out uh, scenario. If you pick the wrong account, um, it's going to be a slog, and you're not going to be able to get the outputs that you're looking for on the other side in terms of metrics. And I think this dovetails into our, what's going to be our final question, because we're really winding down to the last uh, part of the day. And this question around what do you foresee uh, beyond ABM? The vision forward variations of ABM are something different, and I'm going to take 10 seconds. What I've seen in the capabilities framework is a lot of initial gravity around uh, the distribution of messages. And I see now innovation occurring to the left and right of that, and I see a lot of movement towards this part of the conversation we just had is, you know, how are you better selecting the right accounts? How are you managing your program? You know, what are you trying to accomplish in ABM? And I think as we open up the aperture to look further in that direction, my guess is going to be that people are going to start to see ABM as really kind of more of an account-centric marketing philosophy, some of which has already been occurring, you know, whether it be field marketing with, you know, particular events or, you know, really even traditionally some lists, you know, that people would give to a content syndication firm or something like that. Um, and, and, but really being able to help pull all of that data back out again and understand how am, I, how am I interacting with accounts. But I'm going to open up uh, for other people on the team here to give their perspective about variations of ABM and the future vision. I can say two, two words, Christopher, here. So one thing that I definitely see coming is uh, how to manage the content more easily, make it both available for marketing, make it available for sales, and make it account specific. Uh, and also another angle is how to make social selling, and Joachim touched upon it, uh, and inside this group we've been speaking a lot about how, how social selling will become more account based as well. Those are two, two perspectives that I think will uh, grow over time. And I, I, I think also artificial intelligence will enter into the ABM space, but that's a few years away. <laughs> Anybody else? Kevin? Nick? Hey. Go ahead, Nick. Hi. Hi, thanks. Uh, I, I just wanted to chip in there. I, I think uh, moving from inbound marketing towards account-based marketing for customer acquisition towards account-based marketing for customer retention, I can see the, um, the programs becoming more around lifecycle management, complete customer lifecycle management from awareness to all the way back to all the way down to win back. I, I, I see sales tech, martech, and ad tech all coming together to help the marketing and salespeople work together to manage the complete life cycle. Uh, Christopher Christopher yeah. here. So another thing another thing that is definitely a strong trend is that most big companies have now already got an organization or several organizations internally they're all about account-based marketing, so they're, they're supporting the key account teams uh, very, very specifically, where, whereas before it was like a, a, a more spread out marketing organization. Now you have specific account-based marketing teams, and we see more and more organizations adding that into their org chart. I think one, one, one other thing, um, somebody mentioned artificial intelligence earlier, and I think, yeah, I mean, this is where predictive analytics, I think, is going to get, you know, more further embedded into account-based marketing, you know, and it's going to evolve into AI, but I think, you know, predictive analytics is really going to, you know, be what helps drive um, and, and help us execute the right content um, at the right time for, for prospects. Well, we are uh, beyond the, the bottom of the hour, and I wanted to thank everybody, our presenters today, the audience. Um, just thank you so much for, for taking the time to share this discussion today, and uh, look forward to seeing you next quarter. And we will have another uh, great presentation and some uh, additional content. 
So there have been some questions about uh, receiving copies of the deck, yes, and also in the coming uh, maybe a week or two out, we will also be having an interactive assessment tool that uh, we will be sharing with everybody as well. So thank you once again. Have a great day, and uh, look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thank you, Mark. Well done.